Well, I've been working on Lark Ascending uh, as long as I've known David Arnold. We've been friends about four or five years, and um, he has been uh, so patient to listen to me talk about this book for years. And so he was one of the first people to read it um, because I really wanted his uh, input on it. So now I'm glad for him to be asking me a couple of questions about it. So what do you got for me, David? <laughs> well, I'm going to hit you with a couple, but, but also just so honored to um, be talking with you about this today. And please, I was itching to read this book. Um, we would get together and talk about our post-apocalyptic um, obsessions and um, dog obsessions and um, sort of walking through woods with dogs um, stories. And I've just been so excited to read Lark Ascending for so long. So I was I was very excited to get to read it. And now I get to ask you a couple of questions about it. Um, so I think that most people, when they think of a Silas House novel, um, they think about characters, which rightly so. I, I love your books. I love your characters. Um, but I also think that your stories always have such rich settings. And I'm really interested in the ways that setting um, affects the characters directly and indirectly. Um, you even in Southernmost, you know, it's a, which is a brilliant novel. I love that book. The title itself is related to the setting, which I thought was really interesting. So with Lark Ascending, you've got, um, I feel like this tradition of a rich setting continues, um, whether you're talking about the sort of the wilds of the nature preserve in Maine, or you're talking about the wilds of Ireland. So I would love to talk to you or hear your take on the role of setting in this book in particular, and how um, it's affected the characters in the novel. I always imagine when a reader opens a book, I want them to feel like the world around them falls away and they just go into the book, you know? And so you have to make the place really come alive on the page to have that sensation for the reader. But you also have to strike a balance where it's just not constant description, you know? So it has to be really succinct and the perfect details to put the character in there. So, so much of it is sensory and really knowing the place well i have never lived in maine or ireland yeah you know, the two major settings of this book so i had to really immerse myself in both those places um in really intimate ways like you know knowing what the places sound like knowing what the places smell like um, you know, knowing the cultures of the place knowing the history of the place even if you're just there in the book a couple days it's important for, you know, for the writer to know the whole history of the place and things that never show up on the page. But they sort of show up between the lines, you know, even if you're not writing them out, they show up in the white space. Um, they're there. So I just believe in really being immersive in the place so that the reader can step into that place as well. And you spent time in Ireland as well. Um was the book a product of that trip or was the trip a product of the book? Both. The book was born while I was walking across Ireland and this little dog started following me and followed me for a few miles. And I just kept thinking about that when I got home. You know, when you go to a place like Ireland, you'd never get over it, you know? I first went to Ireland almost 10 years ago, and I still think about it every day, almost every day. Um, and so that experience of walking through Ireland, and especially walking with a dog, um, I mean, once you read the book, you, you know that that's, you know, that's, that's the book to some degree. I love that. Um, I'm going to read my favorite quote really quickly, if you don't mind, um, because I feel like it, it kind of, in a way, summarized the book um, very beautifully and succinctly. To taste and be tasted, every part of us humming and alive. If you are very lucky, it happens occasionally that your body fits with someone else's in such a way that you feel you are not two separate people, but one being, that you've gone beyond the physical, to know each other by heart to sit and be silent with someone else, to feel as if you are alone yet with someone, to feel safe. I'm so glad you read that little passage. It's one of my favorites in the book too, because I worked really hard. I wanted to, I wanted to create one paragraph that really captured love. And I thought a lot about 
what makes a good relationship, you know, and what, what makes a true love, what epitomizes that. For me, one of the main things is that idea of um, feeling as if you're alone, but with someone. In other words, you know, the concept of a comfortable silence. When, when you can be really quiet with somebody, that's a special relationship. You know, you don't have to feel, uh, you don't have to feel the, the silence with a kind of noise or chatter. You can just be yourself and you're sitting with somebody and there's a real comfort in, in that. Um, also, I wanted it to be sexy, you know, I wanted there to be a sexy little scene. And so I liked the first part of that. Um, and I, I wanted, you know, a, a couple of tender, uh, sex scenes in the book. Those are really hard to write. There's nothing harder than that, you know? Um, so one thing I did was challenge myself to not name any body parts. Cause if you want to kill a sex scene, that's the sure way to do it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm taking notes as you, <laughs> so I appreciate you, um, letting me pick your brain about your beautiful new book and, um, Everyone should go buy it immediately or pre-order it, I guess, at the moment. I'm so thankful to have you. You're one of my uh, best writing friends that I always feel like we can just, you know, we can talk about books or we can talk about anything. And it's really great to have, have that sort of friendship. So thank you. Thank you so much. Totally agree.